Thank you. Thank you, uh, Martin, for sharing this uh, very interesting uh, third session of um, our plenary conference. Um, there were really a, a number of new insights, uh, which uh, I'm sure all of us have recognized. Um, the emphasis on um, really understanding the statistics um, by David Spiegelhalter, um, a bold plan uh, related to health security by Darcy, um, uh, Evine van Dyshoek's um, um, telling uh, narrative on connecting astronomy with worldviews and education, uh, extremely interesting. And um, uh, the science insights from uh, Dr. Mara Kalala. Uh, thank you also from my side. Colleagues, at this stage, um, I want to try something which um, I'm not sure it's, it's the right way uh, doing. I, I, I want to try framing um, uh, the, uh, a potential outcome statement of our um, uh, consultations. And then call on, on you to, to comment and to add, uh, but um, don't take uh, what I'm going to uh, suggest as framing too seriously. Speak from, from your perspectives um, uh, in the form of a brainstorming. So far, uh, I got um, a number of uh, colleagues uh, um, um, Thomas Lovejoy, William Phillips, and uh, Mohammed Hassan, who would like to take the floor in this uh, session. There may be more. I'm also grateful that um, uh, some of you have already uh, sent me uh, email messages um, for the outcome statement or have promised to send those um, in the coming days. Coming to, to my introductory remarks for this session, um, I see um, the three uh, clusters of, um, um, of uh, statements which the Academy and our colleagues and friends participating in this dialogue may like to make. The first one relates to deep concerns which we have in the current uh, situation related to the situation and the handling of the COVID-19 related consequences. Secondly, a set of issues related to promising science. Third, um, a set of comments related to promising health policy reactions. Let me elaborate very briefly on each of these uh, three. The concerns which uh, <clears throat> have come across in our consultations um, relate to um, um, undermining of solidarity, lack of responsibility, um, the lack of emphasis on equality of uh, services and uh, access to treatments, and um, in particular of, in poor nations and uh, among poor people. Um, this um, set of concerns uh, of also can, of course, also be balanced by statements related to um, very positive de developments in, in terms of solidarity in, in some uh, parts of the world and communities. A second set of concerns relates to uh, the undermining of trust um, the lack of inclusion, inclusiveness, institutional de deteriorations in, uh, in, uh, um, in science institutions and public health uh, institutions, and the need for rebuilding um, institutions um, uh, in the aftermath of um, uh, COVID-19. A third set relates to a lack of global action, um, the uh, need to strengthen global institutions such as the WHO, um, but also a perspective that health action must not be seen in isolation, but in relation to um, 
So the environment, the ecology, the food system, the economic systems, the energy system, broadly speaking, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, in order to find um, um, comprehensive uh, solutions uh, to uh, the concerns which have been brought up. Um, coming to promising science, um, um, we have heard um, interesting um, uh, insights in innovations in testing, progress in vaccines, the role of basic science, uh, shaping the, um, um, the underpinnings of any promising science addressing uh, COVID-19 or pandemics in general, the need for addressing um, uh, with basic science, the understanding of the deeper causes of, uh, uh, of the pandemic, so that we are not addressing uh, uh, simply uh, symptoms. Um, the need and the opportunity address, to address indirect effects um, of um, the pandemic and the long-term consequences yet to be better understood. The third and last cluster, which um, I put in front of you, is um, promising uh, changes in the, the health system and in health policy. Um, we had many interesting ideas in that respect, and we will have a challenge to synthesize them. Um, so rebuilding and uh, reforming health system, um, the concept of health security, um, uh, strengthening the um, uh, inclusive health systems um, that focus also on pre-disease more than um, thereafter, and combining um, uh, well-functioning health systems with strong communications. Um, that uh, links back to trust. So um, this is my um, introductory remark to um, this um, brainstorming. We will not have a conclusive debate here. Um, we are not yet um, an editing committee, a drafting committee. I would welcome now uh, statements um, from those of you who have already signaled to me. First, uh, Thomas Lovejoy. So thank you, Mr. President uh, and Mr. Chancellor for the opportunity to say a few words. Uh, <clears throat> I wanna focus on where COVID-19 came from. And there, there are scientists who study these kinds of disease organisms uh, on a regular basis. We know they circulate naturally in nature. And the issue really is what increases the probability of one of these jumping into humans. And in fact, the EcoHealth Alliance had already identified this particular virus uh, in a bat uh, in Southeast Asia and China as one of a small number that actually needed to be watched. Uh, and it's really the destructive approaches to nature, uh, the invasion of nature, uh, wildlife trade and wildlife markets that elevated the probability of this spilling over into nature. Uh, and that actually is a pretty general situation. And I will share uh, a policy review people paper from Science, July 24, which lays all this out uh, and makes it clear that part of the solution is actually, in a sense, uh, embedded in Laudato Si, uh, improving the way we relate uh, to the natural world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. William Phillips. My uh, uh, concern uh, is following up on the discussion that I had with Francis Collins uh, 
about challenge trials. Remind you, uh, the idea of a challenge trial is that you uh, give someone a vaccine, and then you deliberately infect them. Uh, one of the advantages uh, of a challenge trial is that you know exactly uh, how uh, everyone in the trial is infected, and you can arrange to make sure that everyone is infected in exactly the same way, so that variations in uh, infection that might occur if you wait for people to be infected naturally are eliminated as an uncertainty in the trial. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that uh, you don't get the variety of possible infections that would exist in the wild, but there seems to be at least some indication that that variety doesn't affect uh, or shouldn't affect the efficacy of uh, vaccines very much, but of course this isn't really known. The real problem is, as, as Francis Collins pointed out, that there's a moral objection to uh, uh, challenge trials because you are infecting healthy people with a potentially lethal disease for which you have no uh, treatment. Now, of course, we may soon have treatments with monoclonal antibodies, but we don't know that yet either. Um, on the other hand, uh, getting a vaccine earlier, especially making sure that that vaccine is effective, which is something that the challenge trials can learn more quickly, seems like a, a high priority. What I'm wondering is whether uh, other participants in this meeting and members of the academy have strong feelings about whether there is a moral objection, whether there is indeed a moral objection or should be a moral objection to doing challenge trials. Uh, my feeling is that while you may uh, subject people to a risk, if that risk is taken willingly, and if the risk of, um, of people, of the total number of people dying in the challenge trial is much smaller than the number of people who might be saved by having an effective and safe vaccine, then it's a morally defensible position. But I'm wondering what other people think. Now, okay. may, I, may I answer to that? Uh, in a moment, let's, uh, I would like to proceed uh, with two more who have um, raised their uh, hands. And then I would like to encourage all council members, including you, Frank, uh, to uh, share their reflections. Uh, so council members and, and our dear chancellor, um, uh, I would like to ask uh, to, in a moment to, to speak up. Um, I have Mohammed Hassan and Marianne Wolf. Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you, President. Um, just uh, two issues I uh, would recommend to be included in the last uh, uh, communique. Um, the first one is um, I, I think it would be good if the statement uh, gives some kind of recognition. Uh, to the active role of academies of science worldwide in COVID-19, especially in the area of science for policy. Uh, we've seen, as I, from my presentation yesterday, that almost every academy in the world and network of academies have uh, been actively engaged in uh, the COVID-19 uh, issue uh, in the form of uh, producing statements, uh, or reports with key recommendations to influence policy. Uh, so that I think in my view uh, needs uh, recognition. At the same time, it needs to give encouragement to these academies to ensure that their recommendations reach uh, important policy makers. And the second, very briefly, uh, I would also like the statement to mention the long-term impact of COVID-19 on education, especially uh, online education, and the challenge uh, of uh, this to address the area of disparities, worldwide disparities in access to online education, um, uh, the internet and the computers and so on. Uh, and I really like what was stated in the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences statement. Online education is a human right issue. Uh, so these are something, a few issues that I would really like to see in the community. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Marian Wolf. Unmute. Unmute, Marian. That was a perfect segue into, into the two issues that I consider what uh, Dr. McNutt uh, called the long tail sequelae of COVID. And the first issue really has been discussed implicitly in the remarks by Dr. Hassan, Archbishop Yakeley, uh, Dr. Ani, Dr. Batro, uh, Batro and uh, Dr. Lena. The first is regression that we're seeing around the world and what we can do it, about the regression that we're seeing. And the regression has two parts, both what is happening to every child and then very importantly, what is happening even more poignantly to children um, who are in underprivileged areas in all countries. So it's a question of inequity as the second part of the first point. The second part is very difficult and complex, and that is the impact of digitalization um, that's going on in our schools right now. And both um, uh, Chancellor Marcello and I have talked about this before, and there may be a possible meeting on this, but there are both great advantages that we absolutely must ensure as an individual right for connectedness, but we must use our science to understand the insidious impact of digitalization on some aspects of the intellectual development of our children, specifically on critical analysis and empathy. The links between critical analysis and empathy in our future citizens is directly linked to what Cardinal Martini calls the delicate balance in a democracy. All of this, I believe, falls within the Pope's discussion in February about the need for a new compact for education that is informed both by science and humanities. And therefore, I would suggest a possible initiative, just as the last speaker said, between this academy and the Academy of Social Science on regression and impact for digital wisdom. Yogi, just, can I just uh, Thank you. make a um, Wonderful. I, I, I have a few more people uh, on the list. Um, at this point, um, I'd like to call on um, council members. Um, please go ahead, and then Frank Delmonico and uh, Wolf Singer, if I may volunteer you. Wonderful. Go ahead. No, no. I was just going to compliment what uh, she said about uh, the compact of education. And uh, this is going on, the discussion is going on, the Vatican is going on with uh, elaboration of the program and everything. And we're going to have a meeting, a virtual meeting and a statement of the Pope uh, in a few weeks. So the, the Academy is present on the Compact for Education together with the Vatican. Okay. It's just Good. a compliment. Thank you. Frank, Fra Francis Del Monico, would you? Care to comment? Um, Professor Phillips, I, if I may say, I, I would have to ask the justification of a challenge trial in the context of historically primum non nocere, to first do no harm, and the justification of what benefit is derived when there is not an available treatment. And the consequences of COVID are now well known uh, to be uh, system specific and having residual sequela that can be lifelong. So I would ask you to elaborate in a justification of the challenge trial, those benefits that can be derived uh, that would uh, propel it. Uh, yes, well, the, the, just very briefly, the justification- uh, Colleagues, I think, um, I think, uh, we should not go to that detail in this cross-cutting discussion. We can hammer that out when we are uh, at a phase of uh, reviewing concluding statements, I suggest. 
Um, I would like to encourage uh, more overarching comments at this stage. Wolf Singer, could I ask you, or would you like to take the floor? Well, <clears throat> were we supposed to respond to the challenge trials or in, in the morning? No, no, no. Uh, we are at the stage okay. of um, framing a concluding statement, um, not in detail, but in broad strokes, in concluding from the three days of our session. Yeah. So I will send you my introductory statement where I summarize some of my thoughts. Um, what has changed during these three days was a much more differentiated view on the impact of science, the credibility of science. And the, what has not changed was the conviction that um, the evidence-based measures particularly in these times of, of fake news and false propaganda and uh, an uncontrolled internet um, is of primordial importance and that we need to push that forward very much so. I was intrigued by uh, the discussion that surrounded um, Google's involvement in propagating statements of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, I didn't get a satisfactory answer to that Apparently, Google has approached them rather than they, Google. Uh, I, we haven't heard anything about uh, the way in which they cooperate, but I think this is <clears throat> an interesting avenue, whether we scientists should not try to get a better handle onto the social media, because they are, in fact, uh, the trendsetters of our times. And what we now see is um, they really um, dominate um, public opinions more than our local governments. And um, we have to think about our relation to these media. I see that scientists begin, especially the next, the younger generation, to propagate their news in uh, unreviewed journals. Uh, they Twitter, um, they use Facebook in order to um, spread their results unreviewed. So there is something triggered by COVID also, uh, where I think we should have an eye on relation between of science and media, social media, digital media. Thank you. Well, I fully support. Thank you. That. Very helpful. Um, Martin, um, uh, I'm still doing the round table with the council members. Uh, could I ask you? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Uh, first, a comment on what Wolf Singer just said. I mean, I think uh, regarding social media, uh, it's not easy for us as scientists to have an impact. That's why we need charismatic figures, the equivalent of Carl Sagan and people like that, who can amplify our voice and get through to a wide public, compete on social media and compete in the press. And only then will politicians take seriously uh, what we are saying. So I think we've got to uh, uh, work indirectly through charismatic figures uh, of, of whom Carl Sager was an obvious archetype. But mm -hmm. turning, turning to uh, um, the main question, Mr. President, um, uh, I was impressed by two things. First, your remark yesterday about the, um, the five million young children dying every year, etc. cetera. Um, and secondly, by the statements in um, uh, one of the talks today that uh, COVID-19 was by no means the worst pandemic, we could get a similar one with a far higher fatality rate. Uh, so I think we've got to be aware of the fragility of the world and the urgency of redirecting science so as to uh, minimize the threats, um, understand how to quickly get viruses, etc., cetera, um, and also uh, care about uh, um, uh, chronic um, uh, diseases of childhood, etc. cetera. Um, and that this is a really crusade for the entire world's scientific community. And uh, uh, I think to, um, to say that COVID-19 has been a wake up call showing how the world is so interconnected now in a way it wasn't before, uh, how we are um, all vulnerable and our systems are vulnerable. Um, and that uh, um, science, if properly directed, uh, can help to reduce the probability of these events and minimize the impact if they occur. Um, and uh, this should be a, um, a global crusade for all scientists. 
Thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, read the list of uh, colleagues who have raised their hands um, and um, thereafter um, come um, to closure. Um, Edward de Robertis, David Volcom, um, then I have uh, Jose Onucic and Pierre Lena, and then I would call on our dear Chancellor Marcelo um, to give us some reflections um, uh, if, um, if you would like to. Eddie, would you come first? Y yes, yes. I, I would like to comment on the challenge of uh, academician Phillips. I think that's one of the most interesting ideas I thought because what he is saying is that we have to decide which vaccine is going to be better. So we're going to have, you know, multiple vaccines. And so I, I, th I think this is a modern world, but as you may know, malaria was found to be transmitted by mosquitoes in Rome by biting people by biting soldiers that were volunteers. That's how, that's how the, drain, the swamps in Rome became to be drained. So I think that this challenge thing to distinguish between vaccines would be a, a very in, in, interesting thing. And now we have therapeutics like this Regeneron, which was so effective. And so uh, I think that that's a very good idea because how many vaccines are we going to have? That, that's my point. Thank so you. I, I, I'm with Philips on this one and not so much with Delmonico. Okay, we are getting nicely devices, divisive <laughs> scientists. Um, this is good. Um, David Borkom. Thank you, President. First, I would like to introduce myself to academicians. This is my first participation in an academy meeting and it's been a tremendous privilege and very stimulating to join you all for the discussion. I wanted to pick up on a point made by Francis Collins in the discussion uh, or in response to the questions that were put to him yesterday and about the importance of data science. And I just want to emphasize how important this really is and how it is not sufficiently emphasized. It's relevant to COVID, of course. It's also um, re relevant to preventative health care uh, that Lord Darcy referred to. So in COVID, um, we are dealing with huge amounts of data. Uh, we have test and trace systems, but the value of the test and trace systems is rather limited because all of the information that we have about people is that they're infected or not infected. Uh, we'd like to know more about them, what type of people they are, where they're going, and when we've got that type of data, we can build up a more complete picture um, of how the network of infection is working. And uh, relevant to my research, I would say that systems biologists are very used to dealing with complex networks of interactions, and I think that many of the concepts from um, systems biology can be brought to play um, in, this, in this problem. I think it's also relevant to preventative healthcare that Lord Darcy referred to because um, it's not simple. There are no interventions that will, that will be preventative for everybody uh, in the population. You've got some interventions, exercise will be good for some people, less good for other people. Orange juice will be good for some people, less good for other people. We need um, data and sophisticated um, data gathering in order to draw up a, a, a good picture of what we would do in terms of interventions for uh, prevention. And of course, gathering data on such a large scale brings ethical complications and also elements of trust. How do we get people to trust science and the science establishment and the governments um, to uh, to actually hold these uh, sorts of data. So I think the importance of data science is something that I would like to see the Academy uh, emphasizing in a final communication from this meeting. Thank you. And thank you very much and a warm welcome um, as a 
freshly appointed member of our academy. Thank you very much. Jose Onochek, um, the same remark applies to you. Um, um, take the floor, please. Okay, I wanna thank you, uh, President von Braun. I want to follow Dave and uh, introduce myself as a new academician. And uh, I want to thank all of you for the confidence of choosing me to join you as, as a member of this great academy. I want to make a remark here, I send a small write-up to Professor von Braun on the subject, that this is a special time for us as scientists. At the same time, there is some problems with science. There's a great time for a science. See, the large majority of the population is trusting the scientists to come with a solution for a crisis. Okay, so distrust on the society, and you see basically, listen to many news here, the scientists listen to that, that brings enormous responsibility to us. And I think we have to take this responsibility extremely serious. And I want to put a call to every scientist, not only people in the medical science, to be part of this effort. We have heard a lot about data. And a lot of people come from computer science and other areas can sort of uh, get at this particular time of crisis, sort of refocus their science to move to new ideas into this field. Uh, we have a lot of people developing new technologies, new instruments, new things. So in this time of crisis, scientists are normally not involved in medical science. They can sort of uh, redo and move into this area. Uh, social sciences, the impact on society, we just talk about learning and education. So, and uh, psychology. So you can go to every part of science. They all can get involved in this effort. So it's very important that we, that we assume our responsibility as scientists. And basically the world's counting on us. And we have to sort of uh, think about how can we get out of our comfort level and sort of contribute to this effort any way we can. And the academies can take a major role on that. And I think the Pontifico Academy of Science is doing great at this moment by putting this effort, by guiding us and also telling us what the problems are and unifying these efforts and sort of synergizing all the scientists towards this goal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pia-Lena. Yeah. Uh, yes, do you see me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I would like to stress the point that uh, for the young people, uh, the impact on the knowledge uh, due to the COVID and pandemics is already very strong, as it was said before. Uh, and we have to, to mobilize ourselves in line with uh, Pope Francis' uh, message to, to help on that. But there is another aspect, uh, which is the fear, the anxiety, uh, the feeling the, of threat that uh, the young generation in general, and not only the poorest ones, feels after these months of pandemics. Uh, at the French Academy, we took an initiative to try to contact directly through many media uh, on top of the uh, schools themselves during the summer, uh, young children, say age eight to 14, to try to explain to them what we were living with the pandemics and, and the basic science of it as far as one. Uh, this seems to be uh, working uh, at a small scale and maybe we could take a much larger initiative and this could be a recommendation from the conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last, before I call on um, Chancellor Marcelo, uh, I give the floor to Haibo Wang. Haibo Wang? Yes. Um, so for the um, promising science section, uh, I think we need to consider the possibility, the science may be not that promising. So um, uh, the vaccine, we are hoping so much, uh, the first generation vaccine may not provide the solution we are expected. Uh, there's two possibilities. Uh, we can fail scientifically because so far the vaccine has entered the phase three study and only one vaccine has shown has the uh, ability to clean the upper respiratory tract, which means have the uh, a significant protection on the human being. And that 
increase of antibody we have seen in the phase two trial may only decrease the severity of the disease, may not cut transmission as we expected. And also very alarming, we have seen a reinfection of the patient who contract the virus and recovered. So the one of the clinical elements we are missing is how long the antibody can protect us. So we can, the first generation vaccine may fail scientifically in provide the one-time solution we expected. And second, we may fail socially because we may fail to efficiently allocate vaccine to the most vulnerable population or to the most vulnerable nation uh, at global coordination. And also we have seen uh, the people's reluctant to take the vaccine. And also we have seen the mutation of the vaccine, mutation of the virus. Uh, currently it's steady, the contagious ability increased, um, but we don't know whether another mutation is coming to increase the mortality. So uh, we are may in facing the short window time, if we don't use it widely, we may wisely may, may lose the opportunity. So I suggest in the promising science section, we address these possibilities. Thank you. Um, I know that there are more who would like to take the floor. Uh, let me suggest that um, we do that in different virtual forms uh, with uh, written inputs once we are a step further. Marcelo, uh, may I ask you to say um, a few words from your side, including thanking our great speakers and uh, all participants in the conference from your perspective, Marcelo. Okay, so I thank all the participants, active and passive, and uh, for the communication of very new things, information, <coughs> and uh, but in conclusion, I think that the vir this virus is a very incredible virus and we don't know too much. We know, we know something, we know uh, the diffusion, we know some medicine, uh, we know the importance of the antibodies, but in some sense, the, the king is naked. <laughs> so uh, I, I was very impressed also of Collins when he say, uh, you are an academy of sciences in the context of uh, faith. And so I think it's important also to, to pray to the lamentation I say, uh, Collins, uh, that God uh, make some illumination more clear to the minds of the scientific people to know more about solutions and to more, more about medicines and to more more about vaccines and this kind of thing. So this other part I think is very important because the vi this virus is really something that super our understanding. In, 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 so we need to have uh, more clear solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, we are at the end of a fascinating um, plenary session of um, uh, the new form. Um, in uh, uh, the follow-up, you will hear from us. Uh, we count on your inputs. Um, my special thanks, of course, to all the speakers who um, have contributed greatly with their uh, insights. Um, and um, I look forward um, that um, we find ways to communicate in this way or in the traditional way in the future. Um, the um, uh, COVID-19 virus has infected uh, people in terms of their health, but it also has infected societies and politics, and it has infected the way um, fair, transparent uh, communication um, has been undermined um, and whole institutions have been uh, undermined. So this far reaching um, uh, infectious effects uh, need our attention in the science community. 
um, we need to find ways to um, uh, to integrate, um, to come together, be evidence-based, uh, fair to each other, and not um, let ever uh, divisiveness uh, come in the way of how we as scientists operate. And we need to remain international and respectful to um, different communities and different thoughts. With these um, remarks, I um, say goodbye to you and stay healthy and well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.